you all for coming today. Um, my name is Maddie Dawes, if you don't know me. Here's a little bit about me. I am a senior at Grand Union High School. Uh, I'm going to be going to Colorado School of Mines next year, and I'm involved in the Grand Union uh, varsity swim team. So that's a little bit about me, just you know, who I am going into this. All right, so also I'd like to give a shout out to my uh, expert advisory committee, who is uh, Chad Fisher. He's actually right here, Dr. Chad Fisher. Um, he has helped me a lot in this project in planning and in creating it. He is a the vice president of uh, engineering for Seeker. He's a PhD in engineering systems from Colorado School of Mines, and he has extensive knowledge of mechanical engineering. And that has been extremely useful throughout my project. Uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to some other people who are here today. Um, first is my mother. She's here too, Jill Dawes. Uh, she's helped me financially, morally, and in uh, you know everything other aspects that mothers can do. Uh, and also my father, he is out flying right now, um, but he has helped me in some of the design since he also has a degree in a master's degree in engineering, and he's been there for moral support as well. My friend Aaron Sierzinski has helped me with proofreading all of my work and making sure that it's up to par with what I want to express. Um, and I'd also like to give a shout out to Chad Carrico. We've bounced some ideas off of each other. He's a PhD in nuclear engineering from Northwestern, and he's been helpful in just sort of getting, getting some ideas and getting the ideas flowing. Okay, so I'd like to play this video first. This is a video presenting a little bit about microfluidics, and um, I'll discuss it further, but this video does it pretty well to begin with. I'm Ben Hadwin, I'm a researcher in the Health and Energy Technology Group at Sharp Laboratories of Europe in Oxford, and I'm researching brand new technologies for testing blood using microfluidics. Fluidics is about being able to work with tiny uh, microlitre volumes of fluid um, so tests can be done very quickly and um, very efficiently using a very small amount of pressure substances uh, like your own blood. So imagine at the moment when you go to the doctors, the doctor thinks you're ill, he wants to take a blood test, uh, but he has to send the sample of blood to the hospital and you have to wait two or three days to get a result. Wouldn't it be great if he could do that test? And during your appointment in the surgery and get an instant result of several complicated things. The key feature of the technology is that we'll be able to do many tests on the same droplet of blood to test for many things, whereas currently that would have to be done on a hospital, on a big machine that would take several hours. It would be possible to do that within the doctor's surgery, within the time of your appointment, to give a very accurate picture of what might be wrong with you, so the GP can treat you that much. So a simple microfluidic chip such as this, we could input fluid via input parts, um, and then various complicated electronics and fluidics can create controlled chemical reactions to do uh, difficult biochemical diagnostic tests, all on this chip um, within a matter of minutes to give a result directly to a trained health professional such as a doctor or a nurse. We see our device in action. We place a droplet of blood onto the substrate, and electronics underneath are splitting it up into smaller sub droplets, and we'll perform a series of chemical reactions on the blood. So, in this example, we are testing the concentration of glucose, much as you would at the moment if you were a diabetic. In the final step of the reaction, we see the liquid change colour, and from the amount of colour change, we measure how much glucose there was in the blood. Uh, so there's a multidisciplinary team of us here, the physics, electronics people. We're working with Southampton University as well, with biochemistry researchers. Um, in the future we hope to be working directly with clinicians and healthcare professionals. We think this is revolutionary new technology, it could also be used in a number of other applications, such as detecting infection in hospital, uh, detecting viruses, drug discovery, and possibly many other things. And um, we think in the future, uh, it can transform and revolutionise healthcare. Maybe in five to ten years, and um, you'll see this technology yourself when you go to the doctor. 
challenges. One day, our hope is that this great new technology will help to save lives. So basically, like he just said, microfluidics is the manipulation of fluids at a very, very small level. That can be extremely useful in areas such as third world countries where microfluidics has been utilized in order to have people have a paper, for example, there's a paper microfluidic that can be given to people. They can put a drop of urine on it and that urine will tell the doctors based on the colors that the microfluidics uh, filters the urine into. It can tell the doctors a lot about the person, about what they need, uh, and about what the doctors can do for them. So microfluidics is very helpful for that reason. Uh, as I said, the paper microfluidics are actually less than a cent, as you'll see in the, in the new slides uh, after this one. And the microfluidics that um, are used today in ho that can be used in hospitals will be much less expensive than the machines that are typically used to um, examine and uh, examine blood and other uh, material, other fluids such as that. Um, there's also an aspect to my project of soft robotics. Soft robotics has promise in the field of surgery as well as in search and rescue. This right here, uh, this machine, is called the Da Vinci. Uh, it costs two million dollars, so it's pretty expensive, and it still has a bunch of lawsuits against it for things that have, you know, that have bust or burst of, uh, capillaries or smaller, very small things. So soft robotics can help in surgery because obviously they're softer and they can not be as um, uh, hurtful towards humans. Um, soft robotics also, as I said, has applications in search and rescue um, for a, a lot of for a lot of uh, robotics, they're limited by the um, electronics that are on them. They can't compress. But with soft robotics, it's very simple. It's very easy to compress it. There's a video um, that I sadly didn't include of a soft robotic similar to this one being crushed by a car and still being able to actuate. So it's very uh, able to go through very small spaces um, and very influential. Um, I was also inspired by this right here. It's called the Octobot, um, kind of silly name, but it's a little machine about the size of maybe a coin, a quarter. Uh, it's very small, and what it, it's basically the proof and concept that inspired me to create this. So what the Octobot is, it's just it's the proof and concept of microfluidics being used to actuate something. Um, and so what that showed me was that it really introduced me to microfluidics and you know the applications that it can be used for. And I think that microfluidics, as I'll discuss later, is a very rapidly growing field that will have um, a very large impact in the future. Um, my project description is the modeling of a soft robot capable of receiving stimulus pneumatically through a microfluidic controller and reacting it accordingly. This is an example of a soft robotic gripper. So soft robotics also can be used uh, in place of prosthetics, too. Um, it can be used, obviously, to help people pick up things. Uh, I know that they've already proposed this for a number of things. This is a picking up an egg and then putting it back down. Uh, you don't need a lot of calculations for this, except for in creating the soft robot. Um, so it's very useful for just very simple um, applications. Okay. Okay, my research included the materials and costs of the soft robotics, lithography, chemicals, mechanical engineering, microfluidics, which is the largest part of my project by far, and uh, learning new softwares. Um, so the PDMS that I used is polydimethyl cyoxy. Uh, it's a polymer that is um, mostly used in microfluidics. Um, so what it, it, it's mostly used in soft lithography, which I'll discuss in the next slide. Um, the kind that I was looking at and the kind that was mostly discussed is Slackguard 184 by Dow Corning. Um, and that costs about $59.38 for one to three containers. I don't know why they include one to three in there. It's a bit weird, but you can get one to three containers for uh, $59.38. 
Uh, fabrication of a microfluidic device, paper-based, as I discussed before, is pretty much less than a cent for the paper and patterning. It's wax patterning, so it's not very expensive at all, and it's on paper. Um, so that's also very inexpensive. So that's why it can be used in areas such as third world countries. Um, it's very, it's much cheaper than glucose meters, which cost anywhere from 20 to 150. Blood chemistry analyzers from 500 to 5,000, and influenza kits that cost 300 to 500. So you can see how microfluidics is able to kind of um, minimize the need for big amounts of fluid while maximizing the cost or the output. Um, however, the cost of fabrication for a completely new device, such as mine, ended up being around $150, which was a bit out of my budget. I decided to try and go under $100 just to kind of prove that I could do something with less, with that amount of money. Um, and I will continue searching for other companies to fabricate. I don't think I'm done with this project yet. Um, I'm very interested in microfluidics, if you can't tell. And uh, I think I'm going to try and pursue it later on in life. Um, as I go forward into college, uh, I'm probably going to try to research more into that. And it's very, it's, it's microfluidics is in its infancy right now. So um, if I can do anything to help kind of up the status of microfluidics, that would be awesome. So lithography is the process by which microfluidic, uh, microfluidic chips are fabricated. Um, lithography is the process of printing from a flat surface treated um, to repel the ink except for it's prepared for printing. And photolithography, which is the kind that is used for microfluidics, does that by UV expo uh, exposition. Um, I do have a video of this because it is a bit weird to understand. Um, and <laughs> the intro is very long, so I'm just going to skip to where it actually starts. Part of the time we stand here doing photography, it's a little bit different than what we do here. This is a mask we use for testing the tools. It's got lines that range from 100 microns, or about the size of a human hair, down to about uh, two, 1 micron, or 1,000 nanometers. Shine the light through the mask, and either the photoresist is exposed or it's not exposed. So that it means it's either got light or it has no light. So again, that's why it's uh, black and white with only two colors. Uh, either exposed by light or not exposed by light. And then we're able to take the pattern that's on our photo mask and have it appear on our substrate. And then we can use that to help build our nano device. Okay. Um, so this is the photo mask. And uh, I'm going to pause it and move on. So, uh, the chemicals I would be using, or I would be using, um, would be 50% with hydrogen peroxide and yeah, the catalase from a cow liver. Um, in order to create the uh, chemical decomposition I need to, in order to create uh, the pressure actuation from the gas reacting. So that's the chemical model of hydrogen uh, peroxide that I actually, I actually designed one of these in Avogadro, which is one of the softwares I used. Um, I wasn't able to design this, um, but you can probably see why. Uh, I probably would be able to design the active site and not a lot else, but that's just an example of what I would be using. So the mechanical engineering aspect comes through the use of SOLIDWORKS in my design. Uh, I use solvers to create the body design of the robot, uh, and I will to fabricate the mold. Um, so the mold of the robot would be this would be the bottom mold, this would be the top. Uh, this top would go over the bottom, and these gaps in the middle that are a little bit bigger than these would create the needed um, pockets of air, which would help the robot actuate. Um, so here's an example of that. So. This right here is the pocket of air, and then this is the uh, actual mo uh, kind of uh, material that they use. They use uh, elastomer material, um, which is, I believe it's called um, elastomer 30 or something like that. And uh, what that does, it has different properties than what I use. I just use silicone, and that has different properties than the elastomer does. Um, so I, I do want to try and find a credible source for the uh, elastomer in order to manufacture a soft robot. Um, here's an example of the, how the 
how the actual robot functions. This is uh, them putting in pressure. As you can see, pressure um, increases as uh, wall thickness increases and decreases as the number of chambers uh, increase. So um, it really depends on how you, this is a manufacturer design called a new net. Um, and it was created by a group of Harvard scientists um, on a website called softrobotistoolkit.org, which I found after I was trying to design based on a video. So um, this really helps with creating this robotic design um, and being able to uh, look through all the different uh, case studies that they did. It's also extremely helpful. Um, so I didn't have to test a bunch of different materials. So microfluidics is by far the largest part of my project, obviously. I've been talking about it a very long time. Um, so it's the part of the chip, this is the part of the chip that will control this. Uh, based off the paper's chip, I had a design to go off of. This is what the paper showed me. Um, it's, so microfluidics is actually very similar to electrical engineering. Um, so this is an electrical analog of the um, microfluidics chip up here. Um, there's a lot of different parallels between microfluidics and electrical engineering, more than that, more than uh, the parallels between microfluidics and fluids, which is pretty interesting, um, including like V equals IR is in the microfluidics um, uh, equations vocabulary, um, and there's many other different kinds of equations um, that I can't list off the top of my head that are included in uh, the microfluidics um, equations that I looked through. Um, so I went through a lot of papers in order to find these parallels. Um, so this is the final design of the chip. This is the top of the chip. And as you can see here, oops, um, this right here is a check valve. And I'll explain what that means on the next slide, I think, because it'll be easier to understand, or on the slide after that one. Um, this is going to be um, the switch valve, and this is another check valve. So, oh, it was kind of hard to see. This is the microfluidics continued. These are some of the main equations used. The Reynolds number is a, uh, a comparison of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. Um, and what that basically tells you is how turbulent or laminar the flow will be inside of a tube. Um, and what that tells you is a lot about microfluidics. So, microfluidics is mainly laminar. Um, so, what that means is that flows are not turbulent at all they will go into a chamber and flow along the top. So if there's a three, if you can imagine this, if there are three different tubes coming into one tube and joining together, if there is only fluid going through the top tube, it will flow through the radius of the top tube through the rest of the tube. So it won't fill out through the, throughout the entire tube when it joins, it'll only go through the top, if that makes any sense. Um, so that's sort of what the Miller flow means. The Navier-Stokes equation is another one. Uh, you can't see it, but there are like partial derivatives in there. Um, it's a, it's it's the fluids equivalent of F equals ma or Newton's second law. Um, so this is used uh, to in order to um, determine uh, the force inside of a liquid and um, how the mass transfers. Um, the continuity equation is the moment the conservation of momentum. So um, that, I, that, I used that in order to calculate momentum and the calculations that would come with it. Um, and this is an example of how microfluidics would move in a pressure-based system, um, such as mine. So it would be sort of in a, uh, this, it would short, sort of be in a shape like this, um, and uh, it would have these equations corresponding to it. So, I don't know exactly what all of these mean. Uh, I mostly just found the equations and then used them. So it was very useful to have a, a bunch of research on microfluidics already in order to um, create my product. So this is the final chip design right here. Um, and then if you can see right here, this is where I would, oh, let me go over here. So I would inject the fluid right here um, through some kind of syringe. It would flow in through here. This is a check valve. This hole right here prevents the fluid from moving backwards. Um, this goes into here. There's a fuel packet right here, if you can imagine. It flows through um, right here, uh, and it goes into this thing. Uh, so these circles are meant to uh, lower the velocity of the fluid uh, when it flows through. Uh, this goes into this, uh, the, um, the switch valve, which builds up pressure and then releases it, sort of like uh, a 
sort of like uh, a P channel MOSFET, which is what that uh, uh, transistor was in the very beginning. Um, so that builds up pressure and releases it. It goes through, it goes through another check valve, and it is released into a, uh, an, uh, an into a packet where there would be a, a catalase enzyme, and it would be able to react and create pressure. And that's how, and this would, what this would do is because of these uh, switch valves right here, it would create an oscillation between the two based on how, based on which one was ejected first. Um, so yeah. Uh, the technology I used, I used mechanical engineering, I obviously used SOLIDWORKS, I have a CSW80 in that, so it was pretty simple to be able to design that, uh, just using software that I know. I did have to learn a little bit of new software in the terms of chemical modeling. Um, I did learn a bit of Avogadro, uh, and I created the design of the uh, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide model in that. Um, so that's what I used that for. I was planning to model a catalase, or at least the active side of the catalase, but I didn't get to that. So that's one of the setbacks um, that I had. So my final outcomes, uh, I wanted an example of materials and software like molds. I wanted to have a timeline showcasing my progress of the project, and I want a binder containing uh, research calculations and test information. So I wanted to have an improved knowledge of SOLIDWORKS. I wanted to better understand chemical reactions and how chemicals interact. I wanted to learn about the basis of computer science and electrical engineering. Uh, and electrical engineering came in with the microfluidics law, actually, because of the similarities between the two, as I discussed before. I wanted to gain knowledge about material science and mechanical engineering, and the material science came in a lot with soft robotics and it created a new uh, kind of uh, a new uh, material for the soft robot in order to be able to actuate with the pressures that I needed it to. Uh, I wanted to gain a better understanding about the research process. So this is my company logo. It's dark blue, and there's a fractal in the middle with a snake right here, a light blue snake. So the dark blue symbolizes intelligence and sort of like stoicism, being very calm and centered, and I thought that that would be the basis of the project. Um, this fractal right here is silver, and I thought that it kind of represented growing, um, and also silver represents a technological focus, so I thought that was pretty interesting. And this silver snake in the middle kind of represents, you know, the snake that goes around the uh, staff in Greek mythology, cat cat uh, It's that, yeah. Uh, so that's what is that's what I based it off of. And the snake um, is light blue to represent kind of medicine and that. And audio blue is Latin, and it means aid or help. So my timeline was pretty stable. In October, I was looking into the research design. Basically, I was looking for new things. So that I was looking for a new um, logic, the, the materials I would need, and I was looking into um, uh, I forgot the name. The research I would have to do. Um, I in not in November, it was pretty stable, except for these red parts. So instead of getting started on the body design, and that's what that says there, I started to work on the microfluidics design. I decided I wanted to have a control for the um, soft robot before I did a, anything regarding um, the body of the soft robot. And I would design the body around the control. So in December, uh, I, still, I still decided I wouldn't be doing the body. Uh, I continued working on microfluidics design and research. Microfluidics took a very long time with all the equations and all that bit of math, so it took a while to do, <laughs> but uh, I ended up getting through it. Uh, January, I needed to order the needed chemical components and test and measure reactions, and that's how I got a few videos of um, chemicals reacting with, and I decided on 50% hydrogen peroxide. Uh, I started modeling chemical reactions on paper based on the measurements. I had missed video presentations. Uh, I continued chemical reaction work and designed a microfluidics controller, tweaked the body design, and I actually started the body design right here, actually, um, because this is when the microfluidics controller was near completion, and I decided that I would have enough information to go off of that to build something that would uh, work. Um, so I worked on the VM body design. Um, testing, I did not have the chemicals ready, uh, but I did end up doing testing at the end. 
Um, so I did end up testing with 50% weight hydrogen peroxide. Looked inside. I looked. I found some tests that were already done on the soft robot, as we saw before. So I didn't have to test that a bunch of times. Um, and so I designed the body based on that. Uh, finally, I sent for the final product, which ended up being my binder. Uh, worked on the board and final presentations, and then had the final presentations. And that's all. Right. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, at this time, uh